University of Georgia tight end Brock Bowers is viewed as one of the top prospects to enter the draft at the tight end position in years. The Jets are in desperate need of playmakers in the passing game, but I don't think they should consider taking Bowers at 10. And I'll explain why today on Locked On Jets. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome. This is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Thursday, February 22nd, 2024, and I'm your host, John B. from gangreennation.com. Thanking you so much for making the show your first listen or first watch every day. Subscribe to the show for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so you'll get new episodes as soon as they're posted. If you enjoy the show and are listening on a podcast source, please give it a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube and enjoy the show, give this episode a big thumbs up. It helps us out, helps other Jets fans find the podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 150 bucks if your bet wins. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. On today's show, we're going to talk about a draft prospect who is, according to mocks, mock drafts, likely to go very high in the first round. It's Brock Bowers out of the University of Georgia, a tight end, viewed as a premium playmaker at the tight end position. In fact, many prognosticators, many draft experts believe he is one of the best tight end prospects to enter the draft in years. We know that the Jets desperately need playmakers to surround Aaron Rodgers with, especially pass catchers. But I don't think the Jets should seriously look at taking Brock Bowers with the 10th overall pick. And I'm going to explain to you why on today's show. And a lot of it has to do with his position. Usually when I mention I'm not a big fan of Bowers to the Jets at 10, I get one of three responses. The first response is, look at the scouting report. This guy looks outstanding. You know, if you watched his college footage, if you look at his attributes, he looks like a playmaker waiting to happen. The second thing I hear, and because some of, sometimes I mention that, you know, a lot of it has to do with his position. People say, well, who cares if it's a wide receiver or a tight end? A play, Playmaking is playmaking, whether it comes from a receiver or a tight end. If a guy's a great pass catcher at tight end, that's just as good as being a great pass catcher at wide receiver. The third comment I get is again addressing the position if he's as good as like travis kelsey or george kittle or one of the premium tight ends in the league that's certainly worth the 10th overall pick and if you are saying any one of these three things let me tell you i agree with you 100 those are absolutely valid points they are absolutely accurate points that's not my focus some team may pick bowers in the top 10 and end up being very happy the jets may pick bowers at 10 and end up being very happy because if he is as good as advertised he will be well worth the 10th overall pick but with any draft prospect, there's uncertainty. And I think about a concept, if you're, if you're familiar with stocks, if you're familiar with investment, it's called priced to perfection. Now, at the risk of oversimplifying things, when you're buying a stock, there's a value to it. You know, there's, there's a certain amount you have to pay for it. And that value is typically based on a multiple of the company's profits, you know, you know, in, in the S&P 500, historically, it's been somewhere in the neighborhood of 17 to 18 times a company's profits for a given year. Or if you're familiar, if you ever watch the show Shark Tank, you may be familiar with Kevin O'Leary, you know, very famous investor who he's really focused on the valuation of the company. He's saying, you know, you'll you'll see him speak to a potential invest, uh, a, 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 somebody who runs a company he's looking to invest in. And they'll say, you're trying to get me to pay 20 times earnings. So essentially, like, again, when you're buying a stock, typically you're paying a multiple of whatever the yearly profits were. And again, in the S&P 500, you know, historically it's been somewhere in the 17 to 18 times profit range. But there are stocks out there that go for quite a bit higher. And part of it depends on, you know, what, what industry you're in. There are other factors that go into it. But there are companies that are selling their stock for, I don't know, something like 50, 60 times earnings. And... At the risk of oversimplifying, the reason somebody would buy a stock at a valuation that high is they believe in the future the company will grow exponentially. And even though it's 50 to 60 times earnings right now, the company will grow so much, the company will produce so much, so much more in profits in the future that a few years down the line, that valuation will be cheap. It will essentially be a bargain because while the company may, while the company may be selling its stock for 50 to 60 times profits today, maybe three years down the line, 
the price I'm paying today will only be five times profits, in which case the price will go way up and the company will be will have a much higher valuation. In a situation like this, there's a phrase called priced to perfection. And the reason it's called priced to perfection is that for a company that's selling, you know, 50, 60 times earnings to eventually grow enough quickly enough that the price you're paying will be a discount, essentially everything has to go right for that company. You know, the company needs to continue to execute at a really high level to grow profits that much. There are, there are also external factors that come into play that the company can't control. You know, if there's you know, a pandemic that could hurt the economy, if there's some sort of, you know, if there's some sort of recession that nobody's anticipating, that could hurt the company and the company could fall short of its goals. So essentially everything needs to go right for a company to justify a very high valuation. I think about tight ends in the NFL draft the same way. Now, why do I say that? Because all you have to do is look at what NFL tight ends produce. This past season, you know, a thousand yards is our kind of benchmark for who's an elite receiver and who's not. Well, at the tight end position this year, only one player had a thousand yards in the regular season. Now, there were actually two players. If you count the playoffs, there were two other guys that got there. So maybe three if you want to count the playoff games. I don't, though, because, you know, not everybody made the playoffs. So I think it's more apples to apples to just stick with the regular season. So one tight end had a thousand yards. 27 wide receivers had 1,000 yards this season. So when you look at that, what that tells you is if you're going to be a guy who has the impact you're looking for in a top 10 pick, and you know, when we're talking about the 10th overall pick, we're talking about big-time impact. You know, It's not okay to just be all right as a top 10 pick. You could be a decent player, but if you're going in the top 10, you're expecting a guy to be you know, somebody who may, really moves the needle for your team. If you are drafting a tight end and your goal is to get a thousand yard receiver, essentially that means you have to be the best receive best tight end, best receiving tight end in the NFL. Now, there are other years where maybe there are a couple other guys who pick it up, but the point is, you know, even if you go to another year, the ratio is still pretty wide. Again, 27 wide receivers versus one tight end got a thousand yards this year. So you could draft somebody in the top 10, and you know, this is overgeneralizing, I know, because again, year to year, things change, but you draft the 27th most productive receiver in the, at 10, you're still getting a thousand yard guy. You draft the second, third, fourth, most productive, productive receiving tight end. You're not get, you know, you're not getting a thousand yard guy. And this goes to, you know, talking price to perfection. You could, you could evaluate a tight end as being the best tight end in the NFL. Well, if he's only the 10th best, he's not making a big impact. You could evaluate a receiver prospect as the best receiver. He's going to be the best receiving prospect in the NFL. Even if he's like the 12th or 13th best, you're still getting a big time impact out of that. And when we're talking draft picks, you know, I mentioned some of the macroeconomic factors that could impact a company's, uh, a company's performance over the long run. The same thing goes with the NFL draft. These are very imprecise projections. Now, you're making guesses. If a, a good scouting sc staff will turn those guesses into educated guesses, but you're still there's still a lot of uncertainty. You don't know how a guy in the when he enters the NFL is going to adapt to a more complex playbook, which a lot of these guys do. Now Bowers played in more of a pro style system at Georgia, so maybe that won't be such an impact. But new new situation, football is now your job, and there are other factors that you can't control, like what if a player suffers injuries? You know there there are risks with receivers as well, but there's a bigger margin for error, just as you know there there are risks with investing in a company with a lower valuation, but there's a bigger margin for error. You don't have to be as precise. Again, you could draft the top, you could draft somebody you project will be the top receiver in the NFL. If they're the 20th most productive receiver in the NFL, uh, wide receiver, you've done well. You, draft, you predict somebody to be the best tight end in the league and he's the 20th best tight end. You have wasted the pick, at least if we're talking 10th overall. Now, there of course are exceptions like Kelsey and Kittle. As we continue on this Thursday edition of Lockdown Jets, I'm going to address another point that people raise because people say, well, what if he is one of the best? Well, I'm going to look at the history, the recent history of tight ends producing in the NFL and where they're drafted. And we're going to find that maybe the NFL is not so good at evaluating the true unicorns at the tight end position. That's as we continue this Thursday edition of Lockdown Jets. This next segment is brought to us by our sponsor, BetterHelp. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off our chest. Big or small, certain things can really start to get to you. And it's important to let that out, especially to someone who's unbiased in your life. So today I want to tell you how I really feel about something. You may be thinking the same thing. It's the Jets. 
we had so many high expectations heading into the 2023 season. Then Aaron Rodgers gets hurt and Jets showed that they really weren't a team that was built to go to the Super Bowl. Lots of offseason hype, big disappointments. I guess we're used to it as Jets fans. But of course, that's only football. You know, football is football. Real life is real life. That's what's important. If you're thinking giving therapy a try, you should give you take a look at better help. Therapy can be different for everyone. Most of us have bigger problems than our favorite sports team, and it's important to get things off your chest every once in a while. If you're thinking of starting therapy, again, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be flexible and suited to your schedule. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn to get 10% off your first month. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOn. BetterHelp. Thank you so much for making Locked On Jets your first listen or first watch every day. And a big shout out to you every day, or as this is the daily podcast covering the New York Jets. We have new episodes each day through the week, Monday through Friday. Today we're talking about Georgia tight end Brock Bowers, a guy who is very highly rated as a prospect. And if you watched him play in college, you can understand why. This is a guy who brings a unique skill set to the table. In fact, the, the uh, website Pro Football Focus has even gone as far as to refer to him as the greatest tight end in the history of college football. You know, th those are not small words. But even though I think Bowers is a really good prospect at the tight end position, I don't think he's a, the type of guy the Jets should go after in the NFL draft. And I explained in the first segment that there's not much margin for error when you draft a tight end in the top 10. And look, I don't have an issue drafting a tight end. I think there are lots of great tight ends in the NFL. Tight end is a matchup nightmare if you get a good one in this league because you get guys who run like receivers but are built like linebackers. I mean, who's stopping those guys? Who's stopping Travis Kelsey? Who's stopping George Kittle? You know, even Mark Andrews. If you can get a great tight end, it is a mismatch waiting to happen in the NFL. And Brock Bowers may be that type of guy. Brock Bowers may create enormous mismatch mismatches once he gets to the NFL. He's also flashed some ability as a runner. So, you know, maybe he's even like, I think his ceiling could actually be like maybe better Debo Samuel because you can kind of use him as a hybrid. That said, though, this is not the guy I would focus on for the Jets in the top 10. So why is it? Again, it has nothing to do with his scouting report. His scouting report looks really, really good. This is a guy who could be a really good player. And if you're watching this five years from now and Brock Bowers has turned into an all-pro, I want to be clear, my issue is not with the player. My issue is that if I knew five years from now, if you could guarantee me five years from now, this guy would be an all-pro, I'd take him. The issue is that you can't guarantee that. And while there's risk with every prospect, other positions have more of a margin for error built in. And we're, if we're, we weren't talking about a top 10 pick, it would be different. Now, I know one rebuttal I may get is, well, what if he is one of those exceptions to the rule? You know, what if he is like that special type of tight end, like a Kelsey? And that's great if he is. But what I looked back at is whether the NFL is good at evaluating the players who are the true unicorns. You know, if it's a situation where, you know, these guys don't come around very often, but teams are really good at scouting them. So whenever they're, whenever one of the true unicorns of the tight end position comes at, co becomes available, teams are all over them in the top 10. Yeah, that'd be different. Because I think largely speaking, NFL teams kind of scout the same. There's a lot, and a lot, some of this goes back, there's a lot of groupthink. Guys are all trained the same way. So if there's a longer-term trend about the league, figuring out players are good at a certain position or players are figuring out players are, are not figuring out players are good at a certain uh, position, I do think it's meaningful. So what I did was I looked back at every tight end who has been, who has been drafted in the last 20 years. And these tight ends have produced 32 seasons with 1,000 receiving yards. Again, we're going to go with 1,000 receiving yards as our benchmark because I think that's fair. It's a nice round number. Typically, that's like the threshold where people say somebody's an elite receiver. So 32 of these seasons, only three of them were produced by a player who was drafted in the top 30. And only two were delivered by a player who was drafted with a pick in the top 20. So... What you're seeing here is that, and this happens every couple of years, you know, every couple of years, there's a guy, people say, this guy's going to redefine the tight end position. If you go back to 2006, it was Vernon Davis. You could talk OJ Howard a few years ago, Kyle Pitts three years ago. I'm old enough to remember when Kyle Pitts was going to uh, redefine the tight end position. But again, those are the numbers. So there are elite tight ends in this league. There are guys who you genuinely create mismatches. There are tight ends who are every bit as productive as the top receivers in this league. But 32 seasons with 1,000 receiving yards. Only three by a player drafted in the top 30. And only two by a player drafted in the top 20. So that tells me the league does not do a great job of figuring out who the elite prospects are. Because again, 
All 32 teams passed on these guys multiple times. These guys all were drafted lower than the top, you know, outside of a few exceptions. All of these guys were drafted lower than the top 30. So that tells me that there's not really a scouting staff in the NFL that does a great job identifying who the true unicorns are. And I'll give you one other fact about this. I mentioned there are three seasons of 1,000 yards draft by a player drafted in the top 32 by a player in the top 20. No, none of these guys who were drafted in the top 30 produced more than 1,000 yard season. So, you know, there's a difference between saying somebody can be a thousand yard receiver and being a perennial, a consistent thousand yard receiver. You know, it's one thing to have a thousand, you know, players have career years and that's great. You know, you, you want to get a player at his peak performance and those years are very valuable, but it's different from being able to do it year after year after year. You know, if we're drafted, if we're talking about a top 10 pick. I don't want somebody who's just going to be great during his during his career year. I don't want somebody who's just great during his best season. I want somebody who's great year after year after year. Now, I know the rebuttal to this is going to be, well, maybe, maybe Bowers is an exception. And again, he might be. But there's a lot of uncertainty in the NFL draft. And there's you don't. I just feel like you don't need to add more uncertainty. You don't need to add to the risk. Picking in the top 10 is risky enough. And the reward is great. And again... This is not about whether Brock Bowers is going to be a good tight end. He very well might be. The question is knowing what we know now, knowing the trends, knowing the way NFL teams operate, knowing the way they scout, knowing the quality of their scouting, whether this is a guy who is likely to be an elite tight end. And I think if you look at recent history, if we're playing the percentages, and a lot of the draft is just playing the percentages. There's so much uncertainty that if you see a trend, you should probably jump onto it. If you look at the recent history of tight ends. It's the guys who are great tend to go later on. They tend to go round two, round three. You know, I mentioned Travis Kelsey. Where was he drafted? You can look it up. Where was George Kittle? Dra- George Kittle was a day three pick. There, you know, and it's this is different if we're talking about the Jets getting a second round pick. It's different if we're talking about the Jets drafting somebody like this in the third round because there the risk is a little bit more manageable. And there, you know, the guy doesn't need to be the best tight end in the NFL to justify the pick. It's different when you're talking about the 10th overall pick though. And you just, you take a a pick that's already fraught with uncertainty, fraught with risk, and you just add more risk to it. But of course, the Jets are in a bit of a unique position because whether I like it or not, they're trying to go all in around Aaron Rodgers. So maybe Bowers is worth the risk. Maybe, you know, especially if some of these receivers go off the board early, you say, this is our one chance to add a premium playmaker around Aaron Rodgers, somebody who can make an immediate impact. Well, not so fast. That seems kind of unlikely based on recent history, and I'll explain in more detail as we continue on this when uh, this Thursday edition of the Locked On Jets podcast. This episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by FanDuel. Get buckets on your first bet with FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because right now new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. Again, that's $150 if your bet wins. It's an exciting time in the NBA season. The regular season is starting to wind down. Teams are fighting for playoff positioning. Teams are fighting for home court advantage. Teams are fighting to try and get the sixth seed because you stay out of the play-in tournament. Or some teams are just trying to get into the play-in tournament, give themselves a chance to win. No matter what your favorite team is doing, you can bet on them in FanDuel. And you can go beyond that. You can bet on all your favorite NBA players with quick bets, live same-game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Again, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's a pretty good deal. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. Again, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. This is the Locked On Jets podcast here on this Thursday. I'm talking about Georgia tight end Brock Bowers, a fantastic draft prospect, a guy I think very highly of. But despite me thinking very highly of him and really liking his scouting report, I don't think the risk-reward element is there for the Jets with the 10th overall pick. And I've been explaining that on today's show. Even though he has the potential to be one of the best tight ends in the NFL, I don't think knowing what we know now that this would be a, a wise pick for the New York Jets. And a lot of it has to do with risk. But I think there is a counter to what I'm saying. And the counter is, well, look, for a normal team, that may make sense, but the Jets are not a normal team in many, many ways. But in the context I'm talking about, the reason the Jets are not a normal team is they have a 40-year-old quarterback who is probably going to play maybe one, maybe two more seasons. And the Jets are trying to win with him right now. And the Jets need to get better playmakers around him because last year, last offseason, let's just put it this way. It was a disaster for the Jets adding playmakers in the receiving game to this team. You know, nothing they did worked. And if you look at the players they added, I don't know why they were expecting it to work because not like Alan Lazard lit the world on fire 
in Green Bay with Rodgers. It's not like Randall Cobb was still a productive player. I mean, these were bad moves at the time. But now the Jets need to figure it out. And there's only so much cap space to go around. The 10th overall pick, we know it's probably either going for a blocker or for a receiver. And there's a good chance, there's a decent chance it could go to a receiver. But a lot of the top wide receiver prospects may be off the board by 10, which could leave Bowers as like the one option. You may say, well, to turbocharge this passing game, John, we need a, we need a guy for Aaron Rodgers to throw the ball to. We need a playmaker, somebody who, who he can make plays with. And the problem with that is tight end is not a position where you get a lot of production right off the bat. Again, anything can happen. You know, there can be exceptions to the rule, but I don't think you bet on somebody being an exception, even somebody as talented as Brock Bowers, because even if he does turn into like a thousand yard type receiver, the odds are against it happening immediately. You know, I mentioned in the last segment that there were 32 seasons in the last of a thousand yard receiving for tight ends of players drafted in the last 20 years. Of those 32 seasons, only three came from a player uh, 25 years old or younger. And is that just a random stat? Is you know you could say Bowers is you know Bowers is one of a kind. Well, there are lots of really talented tight end prospects who have been drafted the last 20 years. There have been lots of tight end prospects who have been drafted and have produced in a big way, but they have not done it young. And I think sometimes when you hear a number like this, the question is: Is there a reason for it, or is that just randomness? And I think in this case, there probably is a reason for it. And here's what the reason is. Tight ends are a really difficult position to adjust to in the NFL because you essentially have to learn all the routes wide receivers run. And receivers, you know, there's a huge route tree that comes into play. There's also multiple spots you have to line up. You have to figure out the X, the Z position, the slot. Tight ends have to do all that. But tight ends also have, have their own routes to run. You know, a tight end can line up in line next to the tackle. You can line up as kind of like more of the H back where he's offset behind the line of scrimmage. And there are different types of routes to run there. But on top of all that, tight ends also need to block because tight end is partially a receiving position and partially a blocking position. Now, I think if we're talking about picking someone in the top 10, blocking is not going to be as important. You can find blocking later on. So you're really focused on the receiving. But having to learn all this typically makes it a, a position where there is a longer transition period than there are other spots. You know, receiver, you, even wide receiver, you see guys step into the league immediately and they're producing right off the bat. And, you know, maybe you say, hey, we'll just draft him as a wide receiver. I guess maybe that there's a logic to that, but I think it's unlikely the Jets would do that. So when I look at this, you add everything up. Again, you're kind of playing the odds here when you're talking about the NFL draft. Yes, you scout them out. You want to make your guesses more educated, you know, but every draft pick is ultimately a guess. And there's a risk involved with every single pick. It doesn't mean you run away from the risk because risky can be good. Sometimes risky means that sometimes it works out. But I think that the downside, the potential downside to this pick is pretty high. And a lot of it has nothing to do with Bowers. A lot of it just has to do with the position he plays, where tight end is not viewed as a premium position. And you know, when we talk about premium positions versus non-premium positions, a lot of what makes a premium position is what I just laid out that there aren't a lot of guys who make a big difference. When I think about premium players, they can come at any position. You know, there are premium safeties in this league. There are premium linebackers. There's guys who make a difference, but there are fewer of them at the non-premium positions. You know, a great player is a great player. If the Jets draft Bowers at 10 and he turns into a superstar, that's going to be just as valuable as a wide receiver. But the odds are against it because you don't see as many tight ends move the needle. And that's one of the reasons guys like Kelsey and Kittle and Mark Andrews are so special because they're among the few at their position. They're among the few tight ends in the league who genuinely make a difference. And while Brock Bowers could be one of those tight ends, there's a lot to suggest that this is far riskier than the draft experts are making it out to be because teams do not do a great job scouting this position. Players do not make an immediate impact. And when they do, there aren't the, there just aren't that many of them. Anyway, that's my theory behind the Jets drafting Brock Bowers. I'd love to hear what yours is, but that's all for today's episode. This has been the Lockdown Jets podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Your team every day is our motto. As always, if you enjoy the show, hit the subscribe button where you're watching or listening so that you'll never miss an episode. If you enjoy the show and you're listening on the podcast, first, please give it a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube and enjoy the show, give this episode a big thumbs up. Helps us out, helps other Jets fans find the podcast. Have a great Thursday, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow to talk more Jets.